Hello there, and welcome to episode number 584 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I am Sarah Wendell, and this is the very first Romantic Times Rewind. Amanda and I are going to go together back to May 2014, and we're taking you with us. We are going to be picking a book from each of the review collections by genre, from historical to urban fantasy to teen scene, as we reread RT book reviews Issue 363. This is a lot of fun. And if you have missed our prior announcements, here's how this is going to work. Every other week here at the podcast, Amanda and I are going to be looking back at an old issue of Romantic Times. I keep wanting to call them episodes, but they are magazine issues. We are going to look at the reviews in one episode. And then two weeks later, we're going to look at the features and the ads in that episode. See, I did it again in that issue. We're going to be sharing so much of what we find with you. There's going to be posts on Smart Bitches. There's going to be posts on Instagram. There's going to be posts on smartbitches.tumblr.com because it makes me happy to say Tumblr. But if you would like to follow along, the best way to do that is to join our Patreon. If you take a look, patreon.com slash smartbitches. Not only do you support this show and make sure that every episode has a transcript from Garlic Knitter. Hi, Garlic Knitter. But you will get complete PDF scans of the issues of Romantic Times that we are talking about. So you can read the whole magazine right along with us. If you would like to support the show and read 10-year-old issues of a magazine about romance novels, and why would you not want to do that part, have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. There are going to be so many visual aids to go with this episode. I have pictures of the reviews. I've got pictures of book covers. We have so much to talk about. So don't miss the show notes and any of the other RT Rewind content on Smart Bitches. And follow us on Instagram at Smart Bitches and on Tumblr <laughs> at Smart Bitches. I will also have links to the reviews that we talk about and, of course, all of the books that we are mentioning. But I think it's time to get started. Let's do this. On with our very first Romantic Times Rewind back to May 2014. So let us begin. This is so exciting. Romantic Times Rewind. We are going back to May 2014. Dun, dun, dun. Which is almost 10 years ago. I know. That's wild to me. I'm trying to think. How old was I in 2014? 35? 35. Not 35. I'm 34 now. Um, <laughs> 25. <laughs> that was some Sarah Again. math right there. I would be like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. 35. In 2014. Years, 10 years ago. Let's see here. In May of 2014. I had not yet moved to Maryland, so I'm still in New Jersey. Uh, my older child is nine, and my younger child is seven, and I am 39. Because in 2015, yeah. I turned 40. So yeah, I'm I'm 39 years old. This issue was sent to me by Angela James and Shannon Stacy, who are both digital subscribers. Thank you very much to Angie and Shannon for sending this to me. We are starting with. May of 2014, and the cover is Valerie Bowman's The Unexpected Duchess. And I noticed as I was looking through older issues that either they have a picture of the author, like they have the author's headshot, or they have a large blown up image from the cover of the book. And I have to say, I tend to remember the book cover issues more than I remember the author photo covers, which is probably just because I'm, I gravitate more towards wanting to remember books. This is issue number 363, and the sticker price on the cover of the magazine is $4.99. Was this stocked in like stores, like a CVS or a grocery store? Like, could you buy this off the rack? Like I, somewhere else? I would bet that back in the day when Barnes & Noble and Borders had those big-ass magazine sections and it was yeah. like the most niche publications that RT was there, but I've never seen it at CVS or at a gas station or anything. I'm pretty sure I see, I've see i seen it at like the big magazine selections in a bookstore. Remember bookstores? Remember magazines? It's, we're yep. we're going also, back in time. I think $5 is a decent price. Absolutely. I mean, my goodness, especially given how much is in this magazine. <laughs> like, On the cover, it says 298 new books reviewed and rated. And that's not even all of the books that they're talking about. Like, we have things to talk about in terms of this magazine. As a person, and I'm sure you can relate to this, 
who manages a publication that reviews and talks about books, this number of reviews in one month makes me want to lie down and take a nap. It is so much. And if you think about how many books have been published every month now in romance, like you can't possibly get to them all. Yeah, like these are the site or the cover says new books. So there's roughly 300 romance specific romance adjacent books that they're reviewing each month it's not an exhaustive list no and does not account for all the other genres that aren't romance adjacent like no. nonfiction and cookbooks or whatever so if you want to think of the sheer volume of books staggering out into the world on a monthly basis the other thing that I noticed right away as we start with the reviews is the the grading rubric. And you've been you've you've been edited by me. So you know that one of my biggest things in editing reviews is I want there to be a correlation, a match between the text of the review and the grade. So like when you get to the end of the review, you should know what the grade is if you didn't see it at the top. And if you see the grade, it shouldn't be a surprise what's in the review. They have to match. And so that we have a pretty wide range. We go from A all the way to F. We have an F plus. Like, it's great. But this rubric is very strange. Now, I know they don't have a five-star review on purpose. And I don't remember in whose memory it was, but I think in memory of somebody, they took away the five-star. It might have been a reviewer. I have to find out. But everything is but mostly between three and four and a half t- uh, top pick or what I call 4.5 TP stars. So there's four and a half, four and a half stars, TP, four and a half, four, three, three and a half, and two. I, there were no ones in this issue. I've heard that there are no. ones in other issues, but I'm, there are no one star reviews in this issue. And here's the rubric at the top. So they have, oh, th- this is so much information. Like, think about how much information they're packing into this tiny space. Scorcher, borders on erotic, very graphic sex, hot. Most romance novels fall into this category, ranges from conventional lovemaking to explicit sex. Now, we could unpack that for a little while, <laughs> but we're just kidding. Conventional lovemaking to explicit sex. Okay. Mild, may or may not include lovemaking, no explicit sex. What is the difference between lovemaking and sex here? I but also mild, way. that's a big gap of may have sex, may not have sex. Right? And if you're looking for the may not have sex and you run into the may have sex, then you may be mad about that. Yeah. So then there's, this is the rubric. Okay, and several of these are the same. Four and a half stars gold is phenomenal in a class by itself. Four and a half stars, fantastic, a keeper. Four stars, compelling, page turner. Three stars, enjoyable, a pleasant read. Two stars, problematic, may struggle to finish. Or one star, severely flawed, pass on this one. I like how, and they they combine the two. So it'll have a star rating and then the spiciness rating. And it's, it's a like lot a of weird info. little punnant square of matching up things and then for a while i did not know what the tp means <laughs> in the four and a half TPs. Rubric. four and a half sheets of toilet paper is what we're talking about that's here because like, tp is like toilet paper but i know that's not right and it took me a while to realize oh it's like top pick yeah. Um, and I feel like they could have gone with a better, like a, a better acronym. And it doesn't match what's at the top because it says four and a half gold, but then there's four and a half top pick. Like, is that, is, is gold top pick? Why not just call it four and a half G? Yeah, four and a half gold star. Right. And then there's like KISS, like the historical has kisses for May, nights in shining silver. And I'm not sure what that stands for. I wonder if, so a lot of reviewing places do like starred reviews, like mm. Kirkus has starred reviews, Publishers Weekly has starred reviews, and I believe Book Page has starred. And I wonder if like RT wanted to like separate themselves. It's like, you don't get stars here. You get TPs. <laughs> um, you get a TP. You get a TP. 
and just just imagine like just a giant because toilet paper is expensive just like a giant like 16 pack of like cotton l <laughs> and that's yours to keep like no no, no charmin <laughs> and the dingleberry bears okay no i do love charmin charmin is my preferred preferred um, toilet paper in case anyone was wondering <laughs> i i will tell you that um a person to whom I am married is so very much a fan of Charmin that he travels with a roll of toilet paper. He will After take a roll and then he will take the cardboard out of the middle so he can flatten it and he will pack his special toilet paper. <laughs> what brand loyalty? It, it Look, is, Charmin, if you want to sponsor the Charmin, podcast, we'd be happy to have Charmin, you. there's TP all over this magazine. Like it's a match. <laughs> So let us start with the first genre section. Let's dive right in. Historical romance. And this is a beefy section. So this is 2014. Yeah. And historical is still pretty, pretty popular. And there's a special little asterisk. So each section starts with a chart where they just list all of the titles, authors, isbins, the rating, and the publisher. And then there's sometimes an asterisk if it's hardcover or if it's an ebook. So some of these are just ebook only. But yeah, the, there's like um, a quick and dirty legend. Yeah, the quick and dirty out. legend. So starting with historical, what we're going to do in each section is we're going to pick out a review that we wanted to specifically call attention to. And mine is on page 28. And it is The Witch of Clan Sinclair by Karen Rainey. I think I said that right. Four and a half stars, top pick, hot, setting, Victorian Scotland. So if you see the title, The Witch of Clan Sinclair, you have some ideas, right? All of those ideas are wrong. I just want you to know they're all wrong. This, this review made me laugh so hard. So this is, this is what's so interesting to me about the RT reviews. There's a tiny little review and then a little plot summary, but both of them give you a very, like a very fulsome view of this book. So with powerful characters and a depth of emotion, Ranny's latest Sinclair romance hits the mark. Readers won't fail to empathize with a strong-willed feminist heroine and will desire the kilt-clad alpha hero. That's not how I read, but okay. Ranny adds plenty of sexual tension, danger, and historical detail to round out the story and keep readers enthralled. Okay, so I'm, I'm here, right? Witch, Clan Sinclair, I hot alpha, got a kilt. So here's the summary, and this is why I picked out this book. The Witch of Clan Sinclair. Newspaper editor Mari Sinclair is determined to make it in a man's world. Again, this is the witch of Clan Sinclair we're talking about. When she's turned away from a lecture because of her gender, she is furious. Logan Harrison, Lord Provost of Edinburgh, is intrigued by the fiery young woman. She certainly doesn't have the makings of the ideal politician's wife, but her spirit calls to him. <laughs> then he rescues her from men attacking her for speaking out on women's rights. She's unable to resist the temptation. All it takes is one kiss for passion and tempers to flare, forcing M Mari and Logan to decide if politics and love make perfect bedfellows. This review is written by Kathy Robin. What part of newspaper editor and the Lord Provost of Edinburgh matches the witch of Clan Sinclair? There's not a single piece of witchery. It's just that she's a, she, she's a she's a suffragist. She she wants to go to lectures. Like it just doesn't match. And I am so so into that for some reason. I just think that's hilarious. I also want to draw your attention very quickly on page thirty two. I was yeah. scrolling quickly and on the left hand side, I swear I thought that said return of the prodigal gravy. <laughs> but it is return of the prodigal Gilvery by Anne Lethbridge, also Regency Scotland. There was a lot of Scots running around at this time, I say. But anyway, prodigal gravy aside, what is your pick in historical romance this month? So I based this off the review and not the summary. I feel like though the summary does reference some stuff that I feel like might be a little problematic within the book. Um, but I don't I haven't read the book, so I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But um a lot of the reviews that I've picked, you can tell 
the reviewer was writing this up and like their quippiness or their alliteration or some of the puns they make, you can tell they were one, having fun writing the review and two being like, yeah, fuck, I nailed it. (laughs) Um, And that's what I picture sometimes in some of these reviews. And this one is pretty heavy with like alliterative stuff. Kathy Robin Um, does love a good alliteration. It's true. (laughs) And this is for a wedding by Dawn by Allison Delane, which got four and a half stars and a hot rating. But the review reads Delane's high seas adventure romance will win her loyal fans who will adore the seafaring escapades as much as, as much as the sensuality and battle of wills between her headstrong characters. The nonstop action keeps the pages flying, even as they singe readers with sexual tension. The power of this character-driven story will seize readers' imaginations and emotions. So So a lot (laughs) happens, and it's hot and sexy. Singeing and seizing. (laughs) Imagination and emotions. Singeing. The, 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 summary. the <laughs> summary, by the way, the summary is just glorious. <laughs> it is okay. The summary, um, Lady India will do anything to maintain her freedom, though she steals her friend Catherine Ware's ship. As you do. Sail, yeah, you know, just a friend with a boat and you just take it. <laughs> and sets sail for the Mediterranean. As he doesn't do. count on Nick, Nicholas Ware, whose determination to save his estate sends him on a mission to find and marry India and return to England. Surrender isn't in, isn't in India's vocabulary, but seduction is. Oh Lord! And as <laughs> and as her daring plan nearly backfires, India and Nicholas have to face that love and hate are close emotions. When the truth of Nicholas's heritage and India's secrets are revealed, only their faith, trust, and love can vanquish their past. Oh, I can see how that could take a turn for the stomach clenchingly problematic. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Okay. I feel, well, some of these reviews later on, like, I saw that they gave a book, like, a top pick. And I'm like, I reviewed that. And I do not agree with that assessment. (laughs) Yes. There were a lot of reviews in Romantic Times where I would be like, oh, okay, that sounds up my street. It was not even in the same town. Nope. (laughs) Shall we move on to mainstream fiction? Yes. Now, these do not have hot ratings because apparently we're not expecting these to have any sexy times in them. There are a whole bunch of books, mostly ranging between three and four and a half, four and a half TP ratings. We still have, we still have that super narrow rubric. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to spoil this. If you scroll down in the document that we created, you can see the cover for this book. And it is clearly, Hate it. oh yeah, it's very creepy. So do you remember when all of the book covers for like Emily Giffen were a single pastel color and then there were just the words and there were no capitalized. It was all in lowercase. So it's like that. It's sage green with the title, Cutting Teeth by Julia Firo. And then there's a Raggedy Ann and a Raggedy Andy doll hugging each other and staring at the reader. And it, it is, it is, it's creepy to all time. The, the dolls are also, like, off-center. Yes. Um, so I wonder if it's creepier, the off-centeredness. Oh, um, like they just creepier. snuck onto the page? Like, hello! Or, like, if they put them dead center, would that be creepier? Oh, that could be. So but, Cutting uh, Teeth by Julia Firo is a four-and-a-half-star top pick. Fierro's powerful okay. debut nails the complexities of being a parent in the 21st century filled with a huge cast of moms and a dad. This novel brilliantly captures the highs and lows that come along with having children, poignant, relatable, and at times gasp-worthy. Cutting Teeth is a page-turner told from the perspectives of a variety of characters. So it's like a parenting novel. Okay. When a group of parents from a Brooklyn mommy group get together for a weekend away with their significant others and their children, things go sideways. You don't say. Each parent has issues, anxiety, money problems, the desire for more children with a partner who doesn't want more. This group of imperfect parents tries desperately to hold on to their identities and their minds while striving to please their spouses and parent their children. So this is a group of parents from a Brooklyn mommy group going away with their spouses and their children 
for a weekend. This is a horror novel. No, thank you. This is a horror novel. And the dolls on the cover support my identification here. This is horror. Yeah, what I, that's not indicative of what I would think it was inside in terms of like, mm-hmm seeing the two dolls and being like oh it's like a mommy group traveling with their families and it's chaos no not what i would expect i I expect haunted creepy dolls then if you look at the bottom of page 39 right in the middle hold me in contempt by wendy williams wendy williams wrote a book i guess yeah yeah hold me in contempt has lots of plot twists and plenty of surprises and it got four stars I also, I also really liked on page 41, by the way, the gin and... <laughs> That's the one I want to talk about. Okay. Okay. Yes. You should talk about this. Okay. All <laughs> over to you because I have many things to ask. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is uh, Under a Summer Sky is the title of the book and the author is Nan Rossiter and it only got three stars. Which is like... Uh, the lowest option in this issue, I think. There might be a two we have, star. There's a, we, I think we found two two star reviews yes, but this is this is no single one three three stars not good and the review reads continuing with the characters from the gin and chowder club yes rossiter's under a summer sky explores other facets of their lives it's a meaningful tale yet doesn't seem to make it past the surface of things there are many different storylines, but Rossiter never delves deep into the emotions caused by the various events. All very vague. This is all very vague. Except for the gin um, and chowder club. I need to know more about the gin and chowder club. I love gin. And Roger, I know you love gin. I do indeed love gin. I don't know if I'd ever pair gin and chowder together. I don't like seafood. So if it's a clam chowder, which I'm assuming it is because it takes place in Cape Cod. From the um, guess, yeah. So it's New England and, clam chowder too, which is like dairy and seafood. That's gonna be a gnarly up chuck. I was like, just thinking that, and also I'm allergic to clams. I will one thousand percent boof, and that is not a reverse experience I wish to have ever. Yeah, that's not a pairing I would put together. If I had to do any like, sort of chowder, I'd pair it with like a white wine. Oh, for sure. Right. Something, especially if it's if it's it's New England, it's thick, it's creamy, it's unctuous. You want something to cut through that. But gin, gin and chowder. Some something's curdling in your stomach. That's what's going to happen. My stomach I is curdling like. right now. Just thinking about it. Ugh. But if you were going to have a club that had gin, what would you pair the gin with, if not chowder? I mean, like. Would you pick a favorite food? And my favorite foods are either nachos or hot dogs. I would say the gin and nachos club sounds great. Gin and nachos. Gin and hot dogs is another questionable one. Yeah, to be it's a little, but... those are those are a little far apart. <laughs> gin and I just, I just picture, and I'm going to get nasty for a second, and that um, some people boil their hot dogs. What if you boil them in gin? What if the hot dog water was gin? Somebody right now is going to take that idea and make hot dog water gin. Some some fucking gastro pub in New York City or something like that is going to give you like a is martinis aren't made with gin, are they? Or is it vodka? Either. You can have a gin martini or a vodka martini. It would be like a hot dog gin martini with an olive. I'm Googling. Is I'm, there someone a hot would dog? drink that. A Chicago hot dog martini. There is a recipe for this. It is both vodka and gin, pickle juice, tomato infused sweet vermouth, yellow mustard bitters, orange bitters, and celery bitters. Okay. I don't want to know anything more about but this. The hot dog? I think it's just supposed to evoke, or maybe you just stick the hot dog in the glass, like a big penis sticking out. You you hollow it out and it's the straw. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the worst kind of a Tim Tam slam. <laughs> yep. Okay. So gin and chowder club, not for Sarah. No, thank you. You had another and pick then, too. Yeah, I was very surprised. And to read this review, it's on 
page. Where is it? It's at the top of the thing. It's at the bottom of page 38 onto page 39. So it's the lower Thank right-hand you. corner of page yeah. 38. So it's, the book title is Debbie Doesn't Do It Anymore by Walter Mosley. Again, I'm familiar, multicultural. Multicultural. I'm familiar with the name Walter Mosley. I've seen his books in bookstores. Um, but this is about a quote unquote uh, black queen of porn who is dealing with the death of her husband, who was a porn producer. And I don't know why, but it was just like really surprising to read this frank description of like a book about sex work and sex workers in a magazine from 2014. I have no clue if the how it's handled within the scope of the book. But yeah, it was just something I was surprised to just like read in a magazine from nearly 10 years ago. The first sentence of the summary is something. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Famous black porn queen Debbie Dare comes to a crossroads in her life when she arrives home to find her husband, Theon, dead of electrocution in a hot tub with an underage aspiring actress. Yep. Whew. That is quite a lot. Poor guy. Yeah. All right. So shall we move on to teen scene? Oh, boy. Yeah. This was something. My pick is on page 42. Fantasy, Dorothy Must Die by Danielle Page. Four stars. We're not in Kansas anymore. In this dark reimagining of The Wizard of Oz, Amy Gum is a trailer trash Dorothy on a mission to reverse L. Frank Baum's classic tale. Amy is funny and down to earth with more real drama than the average YA heroine. A mother addicted to painkillers and an absentee dad to start. A brilliantly recreated cast of characters rounds out this promising debut. I just noticed that there's a typo. Oh, really? Where? So in the review, the heroine's name is Amy Gum. In the summary, it's Amy her name is Amy Grum. Oh. Well, now I'm going to verify. According to Goodreads, it's, it's Amy Grum. Gum. It's Gum. G U M M. Yeah, this book has a 3.8 star average and was a nominee for Best Debut in 2014. Yeah, I remember this series being pretty popular. Yeah, she's been recruited by the Revolutionary Order of the Wicked to be the other girl from Kansas. So my pick, um, and I've never read any of these books, but I have friends who are obsessed with these books, the Kira Cass. Oh, uh, yes. Selection series. Um, and this one is called uh, The One, and the designation, like the subgenre designation, is futuristic. Oh, that's um, an old term. I haven't heard that in forever. <laughs> and this one has three stars. Um, and the review reads Fans who have been eagerly awaiting the last installment in the selection series will be happy with this satisfying ending. America, Maxon, and even Aspen are back. The one delves more into Maxon and America's maturing relationship, undoubtedly the best scenes, giving readers a clearer picture as to America's feelings towards each suitor. A pleasurable and steady pace is marred by a rushed ending that needs better plotting, a compelling story story with an utterly sweet and poignant romantic storyline. And I just need to talk about the names. I just need America, to point out that that is pretty positive and it's a three-star review. Yeah, I feel like the only, they only have like the one negative line of like, it needs better pacing for the end. Is this like, um, is this like when you read like a mid, like the, remember the woman who went viral because she was writing very Midwestern reviews of restaurants and somebody pointed out like, if she's only talking about the decor, what she's actually saying is that the food is bad, but she can't come right out and say <laughs> the food is bad. So if you like read her review of the Olive Garden, it talks about like the tile and the plants and the water f- f- feature or whatever. This because the food was bad. And I'm like, okay, if I can't deal with that kind of code. You just need to tell me the food was bad. So am I supposed to like read over this a couple of times and figure out where the negativity is? Like fans who've been eagerly awaiting the last installment will be happy with this satisfying ending. Is that trying to say the only people who are going to like this are the fans of the series who need to be finished? Is that what they're trying to say? Just say it. They're like, 
they said it's like a satisfying ending, but also that the ending is rushed. Right. So I don't. Know. I would have flagged that in editing if it were if it were sent to sent to me. I would have flagged it. But okay, so the names are America, Max, and an Aspen, and those are the most twenty fourteen. For sure. Uh, but then, like, I also wonder when you're like, oh, I would have flagged that in editing. And then we saw, like, that one typo of, like, with this volume of reviews, if you're doing, like, 300 reviews plus, like, feature stories and all this other stuff a month. That's like, a lot. Is that manageable? <laughs> I honestly don't think so. Fine, fine tuned editing. That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot. Also, America Max and an Aspen sounds like all of the names in the infant room when my kids were going into the toddler <laughs> room. In my kids' rooms, it was Aiden, Jaden, Caden, Peyton, Brayden, yeah. Jade, like all of the Aiden naming. This is this is very 2014. So that reminds me of. I subscribe to Dropout TV and they have this thing called Game Changers. Right. Um, And it's kind of like an improv show. And one of the people got a prompt of like, like reveal like a deep insecurity you have. And his name is Zach. And he's like, one of my insecurities is like, I'm going to be a grandpa named Zach. (laughs) What other, (laughs) like I'm going to be an old guy named Zach. And someone's like, yeah, can you imagine all the Grandpa Bradens and Jadens and Aidens? Yes. <laughs> like in 50 to 60 years. Oh, yeah. Um, you also you also flagged a cover. In this cover. Oh, it made me so gave uncomfortable. Me, gave me like a full body shudder oh, yeah. when I saw this. And it's on page 48. And it's the cover for Molly McAdams novella Capturing Peace. It's and very it's disturbing. A, yeah, it's like a it's a photograph cover, so there's real models, and there's a blonde woman on the right hand side, and then like a tattooed man with short cropped hair on the left hand side, and he has his hand up like at her jaw and like in her hair, and his fingers are um, wrapped around the back of her neck. Yes, yeah. and he's looking out at us, the reader, and the woman is looking away, and she has, like, a grip on his wrist. And it looks like she is in danger. It really does look... It this does not look does romantic not, to me. This this looks very... No. This looks like I... My stomach... Like, my stomach doesn't feel good looking at this image. This, this is more yeah. violent and creepy than sexy and romantic to me, for sure. Yeah, I did not, like, looking at this guy. I did not Apple. either. I did not either. Oh, I agree. Thank you for flagging that one. Because I scrolled past sure. it and was like, ah, no. Good for you. <laughs> right? Okay. Next up is another absolutely mammoth section for inspirational romance. And I do like that no. each review section is color-coded and inspirational is red. Wow. There are, I feel like the inspirational section is really two categories. You have Amish romance. Yep. Or you have like um, romantic suspense where someone's in the military. Yep. And then there's a couple of historicals that are inspirational, but mostly Amish. Yeah, a few. Yeah. So I pulled out Silenced by Danny Petri, which is on page 59. Silenced is romantic suspense. It gets three stars. The mystery in Petri's latest Alaskan Courage novel is exciting and keeps readers guessing until the end. The author is superb at designing thrilling mystery plots. However, this book falls a bit short in the character development. Many characters are falling in love and getting married, and it gets confusing to keep them straight from the previous novels. This was the sentence that I liked the most. It's also far-fetched that so many murders could occur in such a remote area of Alaska. Now, listen. This is how, that's how you feel about a lot of cozies. That is how you feel about a lot of mystery series. Is why are there so many dead people, whether it's television or books? But also, if you're going to create a large number of murders, wouldn't you want to do that in remote Alaska? Seems to decrease the chances that you're going to get caught because it's remote Alaska. Like, does, doesn't that make sense? Not to not to diss Alaska. Alaska's great. But I also wanted to flag on that same page 
a three star review a three star review for a contemporary called Until I Found You by Victoria Bylan. Quote Mature Christians might find both Nick and Kate's naive Christian emotions unappealing. Naive Christian emotions. Okay, so if that's what they're saying in the review, how twee is this book? How twee is this <laughs> book? Know. If that's what they're saying, because we've already identified that they kind of, I don't know, cushion the reviews a little bit. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. But um, um, on Goodreads, by the way, it has 3.9 stars and people call it a pretty amazing Christian romance. Okay. Okay. I mean... Naive and, Christian emotions. I'm, I'm clapping in case you want to take this part out. Uh, I'm not surprised considering um, Christianity has a critique and criticism problem. Oh, you don't For say. For lack thereof. For lack thereof. <laughs> you don't say. So what is your pick? Is it, do you have, do you have naive Christian emotions about your pick? I don't. I have a peppery heroine. Um, <laughs> it's one fifty five. And this is a historical, but nothing in the book summary gives you that kind of clue that it would be an, a historical setting and not a contemporary. Oh my God, you're but right. This, I know. So this is Wall of Stirs by Lorna Salestead, and it's four stars. And this is the review portion. This novel features a delightful peppery heroine and a tasty hero <laughs> their good humor luminous faith and heartfelt attraction make this second novel in the gregory sisters series a wholesome satisfying and thoroughly enjoyable read interesting well-researched historical details and the immense likability of the many well-rounded characters make for a novel that's a cut above the rest so this the- reviewer was into it I know. So the denotion says historical, and in the review, it says historically, like, well-researched historical details. This is the summary. Determined to one day own her own restaurant, professionally trained nutritionist, Charlotte, I know, right? (laughs) Charlotte Gregory is turned away by the sexist chefs of every high-end establishment in her hometown of St. Paul. When her... When her eccentric but lovable aunt falls ill, she's shocked by the hospital's unhealthy fare and her crusade to scientifically improve the patient's nutrition earns the grudging admiration of young Dr. Joel Brooks, who nevertheless can't rock the boat if he wants to earn a permanent position at the hospital. I am off mic trying so hard not to laugh into the microphone. What? Googled, I Googled the cover because I'm like, are we sure this is a historical? And it's got like a historical lady on the cover. <laughs> oh my gosh. The title now, While Love Stirs. Yes. Uh, there was yeah, a meeting that about was... that and whoever came up with that was just like, yes. Oh, it's a, it's a chick in a hat. It's a chick in a hat staring at, the, staring at you. It's a nice oh, hat. Should... It's very 20s. It... It says at the turn of the 20th century. So that's the time period. But it also looks like she's wearing an Easter Sunday outfit. Oh, right? she's total. That's an Easter hat for sure. So it like, I mean, maybe if you like close your eyes, you could pretend it's a contemporary. I feel like it would still work. For sure. Why well, love stirs. Somebody a in a meeting was real heroine. proud of that. Oh yeah, it's, it, there's an ad for it on page 56. Oh, God. Yeah. Yep, there, there she is. A breezy, lighthearted love triangle that will keep readers guessing. Nope. Do not want to be guessing. But see, the the review and summary do not mention a love triangle. No, none of that. And I would like to know that. That's a thing that I would like to know about. Shall we move on to sci-fi fantasy? Let's go. Which is a very short, very, very short list of books. Yeah. But that's because we have some spinoffs coming up that are very beefy. There's a very, very small handful of books. My pick is just, I just, I just want to know why. And none of this tells me on page 62, fantasy anthology, long hidden, edited by Daniel Jose Older and Rose Fox, both of whom, I mean, I know Rose Fox and I've like, I've followed Daniel Jose Older on, on Twitter and Blue Sky. 
Older and Fox have assembled some superstar-powered stories in this fantasy anthology from writers of color about people of color. Many of the authors listed are esteemed within and outside their genres. The stories in general do not disappoint. There's an array of creative crafting represented here in both traditional folk tales and more modern twists on some classics. Some of the stories are not quite as high a caliber as others, but as always, that can be a subjective scent experience for each reader. This got three stars, which in this magazine is among the lowest of the grades that they're giving of the ratings. It's so like, why? Why is it getting, why did you, why? Some of the stories aren't as good as others. It's an anthology. That's what happens. And if Amanda and I read the same anthology, I'm willing to bet that we would like different stories in it. Like, why is it getting yeah. three stars? Is there a particular reason? Is it like they, they weren't all to your taste? It's a buffet. Like not everything you take at the buffet is going to be great. I don't, I don't understand why it got three stars. Like why, 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 why? I know sci-fi and fantasy can be difficult to review in a shorter format because you have to like explain some of the world building sometimes. Especially but, if it's an anthology, yeah. that's a lot. I mean, on Amazon, this book, which appears to be out of print, has 4.2 stars. Like, I mean, Daniel Jose Older's books, I feel like, tend to be pretty well-reviewed, well-received. Yeah, it's, it's wild to me because I don't quite get why is there, why is it three stars? Like, because some of them are not as good as, uh, as others. Well, th that's how it works in an anthology. I feel like that is, um, that is a weird standard on which to assign a rating. So that was my, that was my pick. So, I picked on page 60, um, it's a top pick, Ooh. and the title is The Severed Streets by Paul Cornell. That's a um, good title. I know. <laughs> and <laughs> there's some enthusiasm for a particular plot point in the review. So let's see if you can figure out which one it is. <laughs> Using a politically charged London as a backdrop, Cornell puts a clever, subversive twist on a Jack the Ripper-esque murder case. This supernatural ser serial killer doesn't target vulnerable women. He's strictly into killing powerful white men. Uh -huh. bringing, back the fascinating <laughs> bringing back the fascinating cast of London Falling, detectives Quill, Sefton, Costain, and intelligence analyst Ross the Severed Streets is part thrilling as hell spook story and part meditation on guilt, loss, and trust. And I can admit it, I swoon just a little over our compelling three-dimensional angsty heroine, Lisa Ross. This sounds like your thing. It's reviewed by Regina Small, who, you know, I talked with when she was still at RTE, when I talked to her about the magazine and like we would get together at conventions and we follow us on we follow each other on social media so i just realized it was her but this does sound like my wheelhouse for sure okay <laughs> but, so this has 3405 ratings on goodreads with a 4.01 star average and it is on hoopla if you have library access it is the ebook is on hoopla wonder if it would be an interesting experiment well, it's part of a series, so I have to go read the first one. Um, nah, you don't need to. Just start it too. Nothing <laughs> bad will happen, said the Gemini I, to the Aries. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wonder if it'd be an interesting experiment to like pick a book we think sounds interesting from these old issues and read it and be like, yeah, this review did not match what I was getting or vice versa. Oh my gosh, apparently there's a guy in the Severed Streets called the Rat King who only speaks in riddles. Sign oh, that <laughs> looks like it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I might have to read this series. If you read it, I hope you will you will let us know what you think. Oh, for sure. Okay. Mystery suspense thriller, The Goodbye Witch by Heather Blake, a 4.5 star top pick is my book that I wanted to talk about. And it, this is on page 67. So this is flagged mystery, amateur sleuth, paranormal series. So they've got like tags in the reviews at this point. They're trying to call out so much information. And yet the space is so short. It is so economical. I put the cover in the document. This is such a 2014 illustrated cover. It's this super, super 
thin woman, like her arms and legs are sticks, but she has a big lollipop head and big, big eyes. And it's like a, it looks like it's a colored pencil drawing. She's like a Bratz doll. She looks a lot like a Bratz doll in, uh, and she's wearing like a green cowl neck sweater and some white leggings and some boots. There's a dog and a cat and she's in front of a fire and she's got a bunch of books on the floor and she's looking at the reader and it's like, I, except for the part that she looks like a, like a Bratz doll, you could tell me that this, the wish, the wishcraft mystery series, you could tell me that was being published today. And I'd be like, sure, absolutely. makes sense. Everything comes back. I love raggedy back. animals too. The oh. raggedy old cat on the mantle and yeah. the raggedy little dog at her feet. Well, the, the look at the size of that fire. Can you imagine the amount of static electricity in that room? She's going to touch a piece of metal and her hair is going to fly off. She's got to be burning up in that sweater oh, when she's that close extremely. to that fire. So here's what it says about The Goodbye Witch by Heather Blake. Blake has written another winner. Her narrative and character character growth keep getting better with each book. The plot is entertaining and fast moving. The usual gang is back to solve an intriguing crime. And the determination of Darcy and her friends is remarkable. Readers will want more from this mega talented author. That does not tell me anything. That does not tell me anything. So here's the plot summary if you want to know about the goodbye witch. Local witch Darcy Merriweather's closest friend, Starla Sullivan, survived a horrific attack by her husband, Kyle, two years ago. No one has seen or heard from Kyle since he escaped from his jail cell. Now his body has turned up in Starla's apartment. Under the assumption that Starla must be innocent, Darcy and the rest of her magical gang join forces to find the real killer. Will they solve the crime before Starla is arrested? So the review and the summary are so distant. Like their summary is like, (laughs) we've got intimate partner violence. We got a dead body. She's under suspicion. He escaped from jail. And it's like, oh, she did good characters and the plot does things. Like they're so far apart. But if you told me this was being- It's a book. (laughs) It's got some of your favorite letters in it. Like if you had told me this was being published right now, I would have been like, absolutely. Of course it is. No question. Yeah, sure. And this is a nearly 10-year-old book. So if you've ever wondered if witches were a new trend, nope. No. Nobody, nope, nope. Everything is cyclical. It, at time is a flat circle. So what did you pick? So I picked another one of those reviews where you could tell the reviewer is just having a great time. Those are so There's, fun. Um, and it's for The Chase, which is um, listed as Suspense and Series. And it's by Janet Ivanovich. Ivanovich? Ivanovich, I think. Yeah, I think Ivanovich. it's Ivanovich. I, for a long time, I thought it was Ivanovich, but I was wrong. <laughs> Janet Ivanovich and Lee Goldberg. And it has four and a half stars. The review reads, The odd couple of covert law enforcement is back as master con artist Nick Fox and FBI agent Kate O'Hare joined forces. The quips are flying, as are the fists and bullets. This wild and wacky romp crisscrosses the world as Fox and O'Hare hunt for stolen art while matching wits with some untouchable criminals. Laughter can be the best medicine, and this outlandish adventure provides a hefty dose. (laughs) Okay, they were having a real good time. They were having so much fun. I bet when they typed that last line in... They like chugged a beer and, you know, did a lap. They were so pumped at this last line. I can tell how, like, I get it. Like we write reviews and sometimes when we like write a good line. Oh yeah. Nice little pull quote. I flag it and I'm like, yeah. (laughs) I, that's what the, the vibe I'm getting from this last line of like laughter is the best medicine. And this outlandish adventure provides a hefty dose. Hefty dose. Also, did you notice Nick Fox and Nick Fox. Kate O'Hare made me think of Judy Hopps and Nick Wilde from Zootopia? Because she's when the you cop. said Nick Fox, I knew where you were going. Yep. Yeah. So if this is like a, a prequel to Zoo- Zootopia, or at least maybe it's got Zootopic vibes. Did the writers of Zootopia read The Chase by Janet Ivanovich and Lee Goldberg? Dun, dun, dun. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to romantic suspense. So as you scroll through, the ads for the different books that are in a specific genre are in that section with the reviews. 
So there's like, you can sort of see the cover trends passing through. Like you have all these beautiful women and they're inspirational. And then <laughs> romantic suspense is just men's nipples and abs. So many. I mean, I feel like that's good though, because yes, they have like the color indicators at the headers, like a theme and tone change of yeah. like, you know, you've taken a wrong turn at Albuquerque and now you're in I'm in Nipple Man City Land. land. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I know where I am and I should not be here. So the review I wanted to call uh, your attention to is Between the Sheets by Jeannie Davis and Linda Marr. It is flagged as an ebook. It is from entangledpublishing.com. It was $2.99. It's a three star and it's hot. But this is the hot. review. A quick little book with a lot of potential. Ouch. <laughs> that's that's my tagline. Like if I were if I were a real housewives and you know how they like, you know, yeah, they have opener, a little tagline for the opener, yeah. I'd be Amanda, I'm a quick little book with a lot of potential. <laughs> 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 Heroin Jenna is the shy type who has no real experience with men and char- channels all her desires into writing erotic romance novels. It seems like Riley could be a nice enough guy, but readers are not given much of history, uh, get, given much of his history. And the fact that he uses quotes from her books in real conversations seems like a bad choice. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> the mom next door storyline needs to be fleshed out more to give the reader a real sense of urgency. Although Evan Heath, the enforcer, is a completely creepy guy. It would be interesting to have more backstory, but overall, this is a fun afternoon read. Okay, so we have a romance novel heroine, which novelist heroine, which is not always my favorite because it tends to be too, too, too self-referential, too on the nose. And she meets a guy who tries to pick her up by quoting her books at her. Girl. No, thank you. No. So if you're thinking about your Tinder bio, don't do that. Do not. So I <laughs> creepy seems like a nice enough guy, but he keeps quoting our books to her. Ew. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. What's your book this uh, from the uh, romantic suspense section? So mine is on page 72 and it's Partners in Crime by Downey Green. It is a top pick. And this four and a half stars and a scorcher. Ooh. And there was one line in this review that I was like, excuse me? The review reads, the dynamic duel of Downey Green has penned a novel that is so, that makes no sense. Well, it, um, it, it sounds like Downey Green is two people writing under one name. Oh, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. I wonder, I wonder who they are. The dynamic duo of Downey Green has penned a novel that is so hot it will singe one's fingers. Their clever ideas meld together all too well, and readers will find the plot so captivating that they'll be glued to their seats for the entire length of the novel. And here's the line that got me. Okay. It's it's filthy, engrossing, and will please fans of romantic suspense and erotic romance alike. Oh, Believe really me. now? I know. It's filthy and engrossing. (laughs) The leading lady is a badass and will quickly become a favorite amongst readers. This debut should definitely be on your TBR list. But (laughs) rarely do I see filthy as a good descriptor. It's filthy. And you know there were people who were like, I'm sorry, I'm going to hit pause and go find this book. (laughs) I'm also trying to see Downey Green if we know who the duo is. Downey is Maureen and she lives in Pennsylvania and Green is Allison. So it's Maureen and Allison. And that's it. That's all we know. That's it. It's got a 3.95 star rating on Goodreads with 57 ratings. It was only available in paperback from something called Staccato Publishing. I don't think they exist anymore. Then we move into Contemporary. And there's a lot of contemporary. It's just, there's a a lot, a lot, a lot. (laughs) My pick is on page 80 and it is Talk Dirty to Me by Dakota Cassidy, four and a half star top pick scorcher. With her signature humor, Cassidy kicks off her new trilogy with a bang as she introduces the major players. The heroine is the former mean girl in her hometown and she's trying to prove she's changed. The romance she discovers is a bonus in this great story, Run to Get This Book. 
Now, this is this is the summary. So hold on to your butt. Broken ashamed, Dixie Davis has returned to Plum Orchard, Georgia for the funeral of her best friend, Landon. She gets a chilly reception from the town as it's hard to forget all the bad things she did in the past, including breaking the heart of the town's golden boy, Kane Donovan. At when the- you said chilly reception, I thought my brain immediately went to a reception dinner where everyone brings chili. Oh, for sure. Like a, ch- a, chili, a chili reception. Chili reception. So Look, uh, you, if you're going to plan your funeral, Georgia. if you're going to plan your funeral, a chili reception actually sounds pretty great. You know, there's a small town romance out there that has a chili reception. Oh, there's got to be Someone's a chili done it. off, chili, chili, chili potluck. Yeah. At the reading. Okay. This is the part where I was like, hold the phone. Literally. At the reading of Landon's will, Dixie learns that her best friend had been running a phone sex company. Always the prankster, Landon's will issues a challenge to Dixie and Kane. Whoever can generate the largest call volume in a set time will win the company and the money that comes with it. This is just what Dixie needs, but can she resist the attraction to Kane? This what might a weird be, setup. This might be my favorite example of romance novels, trusts, wills, and estates, attorneys at law. When you go to romance novel law school and you specialize in trusts and estates and you specialize in family inheritance law, this is the kind of will you get to write. Who wins the phone sex company? You have to live in a house together or like the sky is going to fall down. All of these things that actually can't really be enforced. It happens in romance law school and you, whoever gets the largest call volume. Which is wild. This is absolutely wild all the way down. I feel like that should be illegal. That's got to be illegal. (laughs) You are compelled to compete for the phone sex company in Plum Orchard, Georgia. This is wild, right? Like that, you just did not expect that. That took a turn. For real. For real. So what is your, what is your, what is your pick? So mine starts at, on page 87 and goes to 88. Okay. Um, And I was like, knowing what I know about this author and the kinds of books that she writes, uh, definitely surprised at the description. Um, (laughs) I just saw it. Yeah. So in At Last Chance is the name of the book, and it's by Hope Ramsey. And I've never read a Hope Ramsey book, but it's gotten four stars and it's listed as mild, which is kind of how I would describe what I know about the contents of Hope Ramsey's writing. Is like it's pretty like mild in terms of sex stuff. Um, but the review begins with Ramsey nods to Stephen King huh? and Charlotte Bronte in ways <laughs> that are a bit in your face, but in last chance. Many things are over the top. The introduction of a ghost, a haunted house, and a tormented author keep this story from becoming just another small town romance. What? And this is in contemporary? Wow. Okay. Sure. Nothing says contemporary like haunting. References to Stephen King and Charlotte Bronte. A haunted house and a ghost and a tormented author. Wait, is the tormented author the in the book or is it like the author is tormented and you could tell as you, oh, wow, okay. All yeah. right. That is not expected in contemporary, not in the least. Yeah, I was like, what? Is this the right section? So then we move into paranormal romance. And if you- Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of angels. It's a lot of steampunk and it's a lot of outer space, which is a little weird. Yeah. The one that I would like to call attention to, we both picked this. This is the first two star that we have found in this in this issue. Allegedly, there are there are rumors of one star reviews and other issues. Maybe we will find we're one. on the hunt. We're, we're on, on the, the hunt. hunt but this is this star. is one of this is one of I think only two two star reviews. Yeah. So this is Mail Mail, Ashes of the Day by PG Forte, two stars hot. But here's the review. As the fourth book in Forte's series, this is a confused narrative made more confusing by the back and forth in time storytelling. 
There are a few spicy love scenes, but the rest has little progression or story arc. The overall plot of the series may make a little headway, but in the confines of a single book, this will make little to no sense to new readers and may leave even fans wondering what's going on. Most of the past timeline may add background, but doesn't advance the plot and muddles the plot points in the present day. So I can clearly see why this got two stars. This book yeah. made no sense. Sure. And it's, I mean, it's very clear, right? Yeah, and even in the, the book descriptions, it sounds all over the place. Oh my God, the last sentence of the description. Yeah, I'll read, I'll read the summary. After 30 years living together to protect their secret, the strange and talented vampire twins they've sworn to protect, Conrad is determined to save Damien from himself. And a narrative going back and forth between 1999, when Conrad and Damien renew their romance, and present day, when their reunion is still tentative, their secret grows more difficult to protect. One twin is forming his own vampire house, and the other has to determine her future with human guard, Brennan. Um, oh, I love it when one twin fo- forms their own vampire house. So what's the problem? Are, are Con- so Conrad and Damien, are they lovers or are they the vampire twins? No, they're the lovers. The twins aren't named. The okay, strange so and talented they- vampire twins. When they said also vampire house, I thought of... uh, Like a frat house? I thought of Ken's Mojo Dojo. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I thought. Your own vampire house. Mojo Dojo. Where everyone is just shirtless and wearing furs and bandanas. Yes, absolutely. Which is essentially what the Black Dagger Brotherhood is, let's be honest. It's just shirtless and furs. Tight yeah. pants and bandanas. And boots. Shit kickers. And boot Shit kickers. So here is a particular sign of the times. The next section is urban fantasy. Oh, so we have paranormal, we have urban fantasy, and we have science fiction and fantasy. Three separate things. My pick is page 96, Sparrow Hill Road, a four and a half star top pick by Seanan McGuire. The first volume of McGuire's ghost stories is an evocative and profoundly creative work that it instantly wraps around readers' imaginations. Providing a new point of view for an old ghost story, this emotional, consistently surprising collection of adventures is also a striking testament to the power of American myths and memories, full of captivating imagery and legendary characters who are each compelling in their own right. These stories explore all the vagaries of being alive and being dead and being somehow in between. Each chapter is a new journey, and all emphasize that this is a book and potentially a series worth savoring. Now, this is one of those things where the review and the summary are very far apart and you need both to understand what's happening here. I had not heard of this series before, which is wild because Adam really likes McGuire's books. So the summary is, she is known by many names and has become the heroine of countless ghost stories, but no story has ever come close to the true story of Rose Marshall. 60 years ago, Rose was the first victim of a man named Bobby Cross, and since that fateful night, she has wandered highways looking for those souls with no time left and helping them find their way. But Rose has never forgotten what happened to her and to so many others. It is those memories that keep her going, keeping her wandering, and keep her telling her stories. So she's basically the ghost hitchhiker in every ghost story. Have you read this book? No. I've never heard of the series either. This sounds like it would be up your street, but it also sounds like I would be totally into it. And I went, I did some digging because like I said, there's, there's always one where I'm like, oh, maybe I'll read that. I haven't read this one, but you can see the cover there, right? Like the cover is an illustration of this woman kind of in like a, her top almost looks like a 50s waiter waitress's uniform like a diner like a yeah. diner uniform she's sitting on the hood of an old car with a letterman's jacket and her legs are fading away but then the ebook cover is wild this looks like the same author of the cover in the magazine looks like the same cover artist that does her like cryptid series oh um, yeah 
Oh. So if you look at the ebook cover, it's like metal gears and a skeleton hitching a, a, with a thumb up to hitchhike and the letters are like chrome and there's flames. Like they could not be more different. It also looks like paper craft. Like it if you does. zoom in, it looks like a paper collage. It does. But I, I saw that the audiobook is in Hoopla and the audiobook looks really good. So I'm thinking I might try this one. Okay. What is your pick in urban fantasy? So it's the same page. So it's 96. Yeah. And it's a top pick and it's Alien Collective by Jeannie Coke. Ooh. This just, it made me laugh at the very end. Um, the review reads, after alien researches, dark tone and tragic losses. I'm assuming alien research is the prior book in the series. The inimitable, inimitable, wow, that's a word, uh, Coke returns to her blend of complex intertwining plot threads, outlandish action, and irreverent humor. Kitty Cat Martinis, <laughs> Brian laughed in the other room when he hears me say Kitty Cat Martinis. <laughs> Kitty Cat Martinis' uncanny ability to transform enemies into well, at least frenemies, if not full-blown allies, is part of what makes this series such an irresistible hoot. <laughs> <laughs> so you the know phrase, that that's on the cover of a future book, an irresistible hoot. The phrase irresistible hoot just <laughs> makes me laugh oh. so much. And the main character's name is Kitty, and her hyphenated last name is Cat Martini. <laughs> <laughs> She's an irresistible hoot. She's an irresistible hoot. So moving on to, to the next section. Hoot. hoot. This is one of the things that made RT Magazine so impressive to me. They reviewed every single series romance and they are all published by Harlequin. Harlequin is the only series romance publisher at this time. And we've got Harlequin American, Harlequin Blaze, Harlequin Desire, Harlequin Intrigue, Kiss, Nocturne, Presents, Harlequin Romance, Romantic Suspense, Special Edition, Super Romance, Kimani Romance, Love Inspired, Love Inspired Historical, and Love Inspired Suspense. This is a lot of books. It is such a comprehensive review project. Like, I couldn't do this. Yeah. I, I could. I mean, you look at all of the people they have reviewing. One person reviews each line, it looks like. So one reviewer is assigned all of the special editions or whatever. So the review I want to call our attention to is, hmm, it's on page 104, and it is a two-star review. And I have some, some questions about that. Sure. So the question, here is, here is the review. 12 Hours of Temptation, two stars by Shoma Narayanan. Tasked with, re with restructuring his company's latest advertising acquisition, Samir Razdan becomes attracted to Melissa DeCruz, a talented young copywriter. It isn't long before an intoxicated Melissa sleeps with her boss, but it will be up to Samir to convince her that they deserve more than a one-night stand. With their differing religions and social strata, can their relationship withstand the world outside of the bedroom? A poorly executed plot with forced chemistry, slow to develop conflict, and too many secondary characters make this story challenging for readers to engage with. I'm going to call bullshit on that. I think that the engagement was resting in another problem, but they didn't want to name it. That is my guess. Because there's a lot I don't of, think you're far off. <laughs> yeah, the, the language of how they describe the book made me really tilt my head like, what? And I don't, I don't remember what Harlequin Kiss was supposed to be. Like, I know what Harlequin Romantic Suspense is, and I know what, you know, Harlequin Presents is, but what was Harlequin Kiss? I looked it up, and, it, and, it, and it, the line it's ended in 20. one, right? Sorry, what? It, they're the pink one, right? They're, they're the, pink like the pink one. The line ended in 2014. You think of flirting as an art form. Harlequin Kiss stories are all about the delirium of a potential new romance where fun-loving heroines and irresistible heroes just can't get enough of each other. All right, so that I understand that sleeping with your boss is like a whole thing in Harlequin land, and it's not as big of a deal as I would think it is because I have got some struggles with that. But like, I don't, I don't know. I really think this review is like, oh, I didn't like it. Um, 
but I can't say why. So I'm going to say there were too many characters and forced chemistry. Anyway, so that was the one I coded for sure. Yeah. You know what? That is exactly the right way to describe it. It is a little coded. Um, So I picked on the same page 104 and it's possessed by a warrior by Uh, Sharon Ashwood. I hate when that happens. They're so noisy inside your head and they (laughs) talk and. The first sentence is really what made me go, what? (laughs) (laughs) Bring Um, it. After wedding planner Chloe Anderson's uncle is murdered, she works with his former partner, Sam Ralston, a vampire operative from a different country, to figure out who killed him. (laughs) A vampire operative from a different country country like is he actually a yeah it's nocturne he's a vi- what yeah so and then it continues they will also have to solve the puzzle of a wedding dress adorned with diamonds that her uncle left for chloe to return but when chloe is attacked sam is desperate to keep the woman he's falling for safe even if, if it means revealing what he really is ashwood has created an original and fun mythology about two warring kingdoms okay what? sure yeah why not the chemistry between sam and chloe is hot and believable in spite of the supernatural elements so i'm assuming she doesn't know that her uncle's former partner like i'm assuming like cop partner not like uh life partner um is a vampire operative from a different country. I'm guessing that's the big secret that he's hiding from her. Now, as a baseline, I always struggle with a romance that like is is based on the idea that someone's close relative has just died and they're going to go to Bone Town while figuring out the murder. Like that's a lot of motions to process and I'm not sure Horny Pants is one of the ones that I believe in that situation. But who, how, you know, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe you just want to go to Bone Town and solve crime with a diamond wedding dress. But vampire operative from a different country? But also, why is it important that he's from a different country? Or is it like he's yeah, from so Canada? I'm imagining that this is probably set in a world not our own. Um, but then why would like you say it, country? You would say kingdom, right? Yeah. And the last yeah. section is erotica. and. Oh boy. It's a lot of Valora's Cave. There's some Karina Press, Sam Hain, Aphrodisia. Remember them? Riptide, Kamani. So the one I wanted to pull attention to was um, on page 113, Giving In by Maya Banks. And the reason this jumped out of me was the first, exactly, the first thing I thought was, oh, Maya Banks. (laughs) And then I read the description and I read the review and I thought, yeah, Maya Banks. So erotic romance, giving in Maya Banks, four stars. In this second entry of the Surrender Trilogy, Banks straddles the divide between abuse and submission. Okay. And she successfully crafts a romance that is both steamy and ultimately sweet. What? The layer of sadness that surrounds the heroine is gradually lifted by a man who doesn't initially seem to have a soft side as he brings love into Kylie's life. What? I mean, everything mentioned here is uh, a good indicator of why I don't typically enjoy a Maya Banks book. How many red flags was that? Like nine? Yeah. Here is... I got a parade. Yeah, it's, like a, it's, a, it's a whole marching band. Here's the summary. Kylie and Jensen may have to work together, but she is not looking for a relationship. After losing her brother, Carson, Kylie is ready for a life alone with just a few close girlfriends. Jensen, however, has other plans as Kylie is in a space that brings out the protector in him. What does that mean? She has been so damaged by the abuse from her childhood that she wonders where her future lies. While Jensen is a dom, He doesn't have any problem handing over control to Kylie once he realizes that she is his life. Jensen's own childhood, oh boy, gives him some insight into Kylie's past and he is more than ready to give her the life she deserves. Like I I did a lot of head shaking when Sarah was reading that. Just a a lot of, yeah, no, 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 that's not going to work. Yeah, so that was the one that jumped out at me. Oh, Maya Banks. Oh, yeah, Maya Banks. Oh, Maya Banks. So... (laughs) 
There's two that I want to mention, and they're both on 110. Let's do um, it. And the the first one is Since I Saw You by Beth Carey. It's a top pick. And I just don't understand <laughs> what this means. Um, readers will be floored by the explosive sexual connection between the main characters in this because you are mine novel. Yeah. The story is hot enough to melt icebergs in the middle of Antarctica. And this is the confusing part for me. Fans of true love will be convinced that it really does exist. Wait, what? Fans <laughs> of true love will be convinced that it really does exist. If you're a fan of true love, you're probably already thinking that true love exists. What is that trying yeah. to say? I don't know. It's a, a word salad that accomplishes nothing. What is that It's like mean? eating a bowl of iceberg lettuce and celery. It's just water and air. <laughs> Fans of true love will be convinced that it really does exist. I. Okay. Yeah. What? And then it continues with the dialogue, emotional connection, and even the settings, including the bedroom are all so real, which makes this a truly incredible read. This is definitely Carrie's best work to date. Can you believe this bedroom feels so real? <laughs> I thought I was in Ikea, but I'm not. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, well, so I was like, I don't know what any of that means. What does that mean? <laughs> if, do you know what, what will convince a fan of true love that it really does exist? This book, apparently. That's it. That's the yeah. only thing. So and you have one other, last pick. We've reached the end of the reviews. We've reached the end. And they reviewed The Professional by Presley Cole, gave it a top pick, four and a half stars. And the only thing I want to mention is I reviewed this for the site. Yep. I gave it a B minus. And actually, if I were to reread this again, I think I would grade it even lower than a B minus. Oh, my. Um, I am a Presley Cole fan. I've read a majority of her stuff, if not all of her stuff. I think I did not read her YA series, Poison Princess, I think it's what it was. But I've read all of her adult stuff. Um, I did not like this trilogy at all. Uh, <laughs> like, the books for me got progressively worse in terms of, like, a worse read. So, like, this is probably the one I would grade the highest as the professional, book one. And then book two and three would get lower grades. And I think I maybe even gave book two or three a D probably on the site, I think. Um, I'll link the reviews. Yeah, I highly disagree with this being a top pick. And that's why I'm like, this. these reviews are wild. As usual, the thing that I always question after looking through all the reviews in an RT, even during the conference, and I would read through the magazine that gave it to you in the swag bag, I would be like, I don't understand why this book got this review. Either yeah. the review isn't entirely clear, or it's a book that I've read and I'm thinking, wow, we have totally different perspectives. Is there any book that we've mentioned that you might want to read? I think that series, so... uh they reviewed book two in the series, The Severed Streets. Yeah. Um, Start with book two. With you can the, do it. Maybe. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that one I'm curious about. Uh, the series as a whole, book one they mentioned was London Falling. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's the one that we've discussed that I would want to read i'm also i gotta be honest a little curious about when love stirs about the nutritionist in early 20th century saint paul <laughs> i mean i can't imagine that it is going to be an arduous read <laughs> so yeah that's peppery. the one i'm like this sounds wild <laughs> well i have added the audiobook of sparrow hill road to my playlist because it looks like it's a series of ghost stories all from this one character's perspective. And they all kind of, like I've read some of the reviews and they all kind of link forward and back. I think I might listen to that one. I think that sounds really interesting. Okay. All right. Well, I will put pictures and images and cl clips of all the reviews up in the entry, but uh, thank you for going through all the reviews with me. You're welcome. All right. And we'll come back in two weeks and we'll go over all of the ads and the features 
And I've got I've got audio for this one. I'm very excited. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed that trip down many different genres of memory lane with me and Amanda. We had a very good time. We are definitely going to be joining the Gin and Chowder Club. I will have links to every book we talked about. If it's out of print and we can't link to it, we'll put a picture of the cover. We'll make sure that you get to see as much of this. And that'll be in the show notes and on Smart Pitches and on Instagram and on Tumblr. We're, we're having a really good time here is what I'm saying. Have you read one of these books? Do you want to tell us about it? I would love to hear from you. You can email me at sbjpodcast at gmail.com or at sarah at smartbitchestrashybooks.com, whichever is easier for you to remember. You can also record a voice memo and email it to me and we can include your audio in a future episode, which would be super duper fun. Tell me, have you read these books? What it, Do you remember any of these books? Do you remember some of these covers? I would love to know what you remember about romance in May of 2014. A special, big, massive thank you to Shannon Stacy and to Angela James who helped me find this old issue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you have old issues of Romantic Times or RT book reviews, digital or print, I would absolutely love to have them. Oh my goodness, you have no idea. Please, please get in touch. Sarah, with an H, at smartpitchestrashybooks.com. Coming up... On October the 20th, we'll be looking at the ads and the features. There's a lot of features and interviews and lots and lots of cool things to discover that we're not done yet. There's a lot of things to talk about. And as always, I end with a terrible joke. This joke comes from Amanda inside our podcast Patreon Discord. If you would like to join the Discord, you know what to do, right? Patreon.com slash smart pitches. So Amanda offers this joke because she has excellent taste. Did you know that wizards don't fart? They don't. It's true. Wizards don't fart. They cast smells. <laughs> Ooh, my dog has been casting smells around the living room all evening long. <laughs> my little wizard dog. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very, very best of reading. Thank you so much for going back in time with us. We will be back next week with more podcast excellence. But until then, Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find Outstanding Podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts. Mm -hmm.